Today we honor Sanford Porter and his family, Part Three. Sanford continues his autobiography in December of 1815. Father's death was a very grievous thing to all of his family, for he was very highly esteemed by his wife and children. Mother was left a widow, and there was a man by the name of Hardy that had lost to our world his wife that Persis, Brother Joseph's wife, was well acquainted with. She had been raised in the same neighborhood where Esquire Hardy lived. They got news back and forward and found out each other's situation, and in a very few months, Esquire Hardy paid Persis and Mother a visit. They soon got up a match and got married. Mother moved down to Sharon, that was the name of the township that Esquire Hardy lived in, and Persis had been raised. Well, it appeared that Mother had got a good home and was well off for a living in this world. But what of Father? The thing that worried me now was, where is my dear Father? Has he found what he expected, a seraphic home where none but God and angels dwell? Or was he just dead, dead to himself, to us, and to all things forever? These thoughts pained my soul. If there was a God, as the ancients declared, why was there so much confusion written in regard to him? No, no, there is no God. What part of man could be a spirit? How could there be a spiritual world? There are so many churches here, all different in their beliefs, and all of them can prove they are right by the Bible, and I can prove that they are all wrong. I am afraid I am what they call an infidel. The winter Father had visited us, I had plied him with many questions in regard to God and the devil, the souls of man and the spiritual world. Tell me, Father, what part of man is the spirit? The breath, I think, for God created man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Why, Father, the breath is nothing more than the air we take in and let out. Air fills the immensity of space, and all breathe the same air, even the animals and every living thing upon the earth. That cannot be, Father. No, no, that cannot be. Do you think that animals and all creeping things and trees, etc., have living, immortal souls? Father was worried and puzzled. Well, he thought it might be the senses and reasoning powers of man that was the soul. But it all seemed so vague and unreasonable to me that I could believe none of it. And the more I talked, read, and pondered, the less I knew. And I could see that I had greatly disturbed Father, perhaps disturbed him with doubt and fear. So I finally let up and walked out and plagued him no more. But as I sat on the step outside, I heard Father say to Mother, Sanford is a strange boy. I cannot make him out. I don't know what will become of him. I thought much of these things after his death and wondered if that black coffin-shaped thing I had seen in the barn came to convince me that there was a power living and moving independent of the natural power of man. And I recalled the time when I saw Beverly Yates, my playmate, go through the barn and over a pile of husks six feet high, and made no sound, and learned he had died that day, and we knew not that he was sick. What did it all mean? O oh God, if there be a God, what is it, and why can I not find out, so that my mind can rest? I must forget all these perplexities and keep my mind on things I can understand. 
It is none of my business how we came into being, or why. No man has ever found out, and maybe never will. If there is such a thing as a God, no man understands him. For the thing they call the Bible, the Word of God, is nothing but a bundle of contradictions brought together by a bunch of men whose minds were as chaotic as mine. I will think of these things no more, no more, no, not at all, not at all. But it seemed I was not to have my way in these things, for people on every hand were chiding me for not attending church. Then there would be more arguments, for I could not refrain from speaking my mind when people nagged me. And one day there came to John two Methodist preachers, one by the name of Shepherd, Old Uncle they called him, and the other they called Mr. Jackaways. They came to chide John's wife for being absent from church so much. She told them that John would not let her have a horse to ride and refused to take the wagon and her strength would not permit her to walk so far. Then they started reproving John for standing in the way of his wife's religious duties. John said, My horses work hard all week. I want them to feed and rest on the Sabbath and feel pert to take hold on another week. And they cannot do that and eat post hay all day Sunday. Then they begged John to join their church. But John was very hard in these matters and told them there was nothing to their church or any other church. They began to quote scripture to him and tell him the law and the word of God, and John, not being much of a scriptorian, they soon had him whipped, drove him to cover, as they say. John got powerful mad and said, I wish to God Sanford was here. Just then I knocked at their door, not knowing that they had visitors. Welcome, Sanford, said John. I want you to show these men a few things. What would you have me do? Shepherd then told me about their argument and said he was sure they could convince me wherein I was wrong. I shall be happy indeed if you can clear my understanding and convince me of the truthfulness of the scriptures. This is the Bible which you claim is the word of God. Old Uncle Shepherd started quoting scripture. I brought him up a few times by quoting other parts of scripture which disproved all that he had tried to prove, and our argument grew very warm indeed. Finally, Mr. Jackaway sided in with me, said he had never stopped to think about the unreasonableness of the things written in the Bible, but it seemed to him I was near right than old uncle, near right than anything he had ever heard before. It may sound reasonable, said Uncle Shepherd, but it is all from the devil. You have advocated ideas that no evangelist ever thought of, and it is all from the devil. He had been wiggling and twisting one way and another, and finally jumped up from his chair and hotly condemned all that I had said. Tut, 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 Brother Shepherd, you must be careful or you will prove that you have a devil. You know we agreed that John and Brother Jackaway should judge between us. We three against you. You must agree that you are wrong. Yes, said Jackaway. You are entirely wrong, Brother Shepherd. Mr. Porter has followed the standard you set to be governed by, and you must admit that he is the victor. Brother Jackaway, you are from this moment excommunicated from the church. You are not fit to wear its banners or be a leader or member therein. You are an easy prey to the devil, I see. Well, gentlemen, said John, I told you you would get your trotters all knocked out from under you, and now you are both, or all, lightning mad at each other. Come, let us drink of the glass and away with anger. 
let us partake of the spirits that maketh light and merry. He drank, I drank, Mr. Dracoy drank, but Uncle Shepherd would have none of it. He would not settle the dispute that way, so they left. I have since learned, of course, that we were all wrong. We were in a dark chamber and could find no window or door that would admit light, groping in darkness, terrible darkness. Those were the days of witchcraft and dreams and apparitions, all of which I think was necessary to prepare men for the light that was to come. There is still darkness on the earth and in the minds of men, but nothing to compare with the gross darkness that existed before the advent of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel had diffused light and warmth upon the earth, and to some extent all men are partakers of it, but they do not realize it. I had quite an experience when I was a chap thirteen, just after that six bell when I lay so long on my bed, deathbed as they supposed. I was at a Baptist meeting one Sunday, and the preacher got so wrought up in his sermon that he got some to weeping and some to exhorting others to come into the fold, etc. There was quite a lot of youngsters there beside me, and one boy got so excited he got up and told an experience he had had. The preacher complimented him on it and asked me if I'd had some experience I could tell that would help others to see the light. No, I have never had any such experience, but I could tell a dream I had one time. I dreamed I died and went to heaven, and the first thing I saw was a long table set in the middle of a room with seats all around it and it was set with the most beautiful dishes I ever saw, so transparent they were almost invisible. There was some food in some of them, but I could not tell what it was, because it was so different to anything I had seen. I thought some looked like honey in the comb, only it was too white and clear. Some of it looked like biscuit, as white and light as snow and there was something in the glasses to drink that was so thin and clear you could hardly tell whether it was really there or not. And the countenances of the people who sat around the table were like shafts of light. Their robes or dresses were so white and airy-looking and clean that they were dazzling. I drew afar off, for my homespun clothes looked so coarse and plain and ugly and dirty I was ashamed. The preacher thought we did uncommonly well and said it was our duty to be baptized, so we were, and were given the right hand of fellowship. From that time on, I was an inveterate searcher of the Bible. I began early to compare the apostolic churches with the Baptist and other churches, and they all lacked one essential thing. But what was that thing? I thought all their churches and ministers were just as deep in the mud as I was in the mire, and they thought I was an imaginary cuss because I had seen a few things they hadn't that bordered on the supernatural, and me an infidel. One thing in the Bible troubled me a lot. It called on sinners everywhere to repent and be baptized and to love God with all their heart, might, mind, and strength, and their neighbors themselves. I thought, if there is a sinner in this world, it is me, for if there is a God, I do not love him. I do not love my neighbor, or even my brother as myself, and I certainly do not love my enemy. And I was doubtful that there was a man living who loved his enemy. For all men that I had ever known or seen would talk unkindly, even wickedly, of better people than themselves if they got it in for them, and I had never seen or even heard or read of any person, people, or nation that loved their enemies. Therefore all mankind were sinners. What should I do? 
How could I bring myself in harmony or subjection to these things? For to me there was no God, and as for a devil there certainly was not any, only as they call evil in men. So I worried by night and by day for many years, and got no ray of light. And I would think of my father, how his soul, if there was such a thing, must be troubled because of me. These thoughts did bear great weight upon me, and my soul did suffer greater sufferings than the body could know. What in the world could I do to get relief? I got so I could neither eat, drink, nor sleep. I would spread my arms and raise my hands on high, crying aloud, O oh, gracious God, if there be a God, show me the way, the right way. All day I would walk in the barn and all night in the house. I spoke to no one, nor they to me, not even my wife and children. I guess they thought I was stark mad, and I doubted my own senses. I did not eat, drink, nor sleep for three days and nights, and was neither hungry, dry, nor sleepy. The last night there came a voice, clear, audible, and distinct. There is a God, and he has known the desires of your heart this number of years. I will instruct you three times this night the way that is right, that you need never again doubt, but shall be satisfied in your mind concerning God. The voice ceased, but I could see no one from whom it could have come. I had a thought the outside door did not close tight. There was quite a crack at the top, and I concluded that someone of those professors of religion had by some means found out I was much troubled and concerned in my mind about religion, and had rode up to the door and sitting on the horse had put their mouth to the crack and said those words. I grabbed a club and went forth to find that person and give him a good pounding, yet be careful not to kill him. A thorough search of the premises revealed nothing, so I went back and sat down by the fireplace with my hands over my eyes and waited and waited, but no voice. Finally, I lay down beside my wife and covered my eyes, and I was gone like a flash to sleep. I know not, but I heard and saw many things that gave me satisfaction. I thought I stood on the barn floor near the south door, and a personage came in at the north door and advanced toward me. He was dressed in a long white robe with a red sash about his waist that came down within a foot of the bottom of his raiment. His cap was white with horn-like things about five inches high, a very odd-looking fellow to me. I had forgotten all that had taken place before, so was surprised to see such a personage in my barn, but I had no fear and went with outstretched hand to greet him. I am a spirit, you cannot touch me. Come, let's be gone." At the sound of his voice I recalled the promise and was filled with joy. We did not travel by our own power or effort. We went light, airy, and swift, and when we landed we seemed to alight on a railing. I cast my eyes about and it seemed to me I could see for thousands and thousands of miles. It seemed to be a world of unbounded space. I asked, is this the spirit world? Yes. Where is God? Is he not here? I see now the darkness under which I have been laboring all my life. There are other things I would like to know if it is your pleasure to grant my request. Firstly, was Jesus Christ the Son of the great eternal God? Yes, he was and is the Son of God, both temporally and spiritually. Temporally, he became heir to the weakness of the flesh. Spiritually, he is heir to all the attributes of God. But the divine qualities of the Father, 
predominated over the weakness of the mother or the flesh. He was delicately constructed and was more sensitive to pain than any other man living then or now. Thank you, my kind heavenly friend, for this information concerning Jesus Christ. I thank the Eternal Father of Spirits for sending you to instruct me on this subject, for it has been a stumbling block to me and a rock of offense. I have talked to learned men about it, and I have searched the scriptures and could get no satisfaction. All seems so contrary to nature. I do hope and pray that God and Jesus Christ will forgive me, for I have belittled Mary and her son Jesus. I understand now also how the male and female are one and cannot be separated. Now, said the personage, I will enlighten you further on the scripture or the Bible. Those parts that were given to the prophets of God through revelation are the word of God unto men and are strictly true. Other parts that were written by honest, just men are as nigh unto the truth as they understood the truth. The men who have been instrumental in translating the book from one language into another were not strictly honest. They altered passages of Scripture to suit their own convenience. Many plain and precious parts they left out, and other parts they destroyed. So the Bible is not as plain and understandable as in ancient times. But there is still enough truth contained therein for the present use and salvation of man, if it is read and understood by the Spirit and power of God. Is there a hell or place of torment prepared where the ungodly are punished? If you will look yonder into the north country, your question will be answered, I think, to your satisfaction. I turned and saw away in the distance a dreary, dismal, cold-looking world upon which was a vast multitude of people that no living man could number and the condition they were in was beyond the power of man to describe, and it pained my inners and filled my soul with anguish to see them. I seemed to be fascinated by the sight. Gracious God, what sins have they committed that justice should demand such an awful punishment? If you will cast your eyes about you, you will see that all are not suffering to such an extent. They must suffer only as they have sinned in the flesh. Will they never be redeemed from that awful misery? When justice is satisfied, mercy will have her claim. Is that what they call hell? I did not see any devils with pitchforks, or the lake of fire and brimstone into which they pitched the wicked. You must agree, said the personage, that that is a good comparison, but it is not literally true. The devil has nothing to do with the punishment of man after he leaves the body. It is their own mind and conscience that torment men. They have transgressed the law, they have defied God, and esteemed him as not, and the wages of sin are spiritual death. I have heard it said by eminent divines that if a child die in infancy, it is doomed to hell. Is that a fact? No, emphatically no. Any man who says there are infants in hell is a liar. It is to say that that Christ made no atonement for original sin, and that all his sufferings and death are in vain. Are there any churches or denominations on the earth at the present time that are right and pleasing to God? No, none of them is right. Jesus Christ organized his church with apostles who were prophets, and they declared many things that would come upon the earth, they spoke of a time when the church of God would come upon the earth again, which time is shortly ripe. 
You may not live to see it, but your children certainly will. And if you will humble yourself and repent of all your sins and blasphemies, you will be forgiven and will rejoice in the goodness and grace of God in all your days. Deal justly and honestly with all mankind. Acknowledge the truth, whether it be for or against you. Cease to complain. Cultivate love for God and man. Speak the truth and the whole truth, whether it be for or against you, and your rest will be sweet. Come, said he, let us be gone. And in an instant we were back on the barn floor. Then I opened my eyes, and I was still lying as I had been with my eyes covered. I told my wife during the day some of the things I had seen and heard, and she seemed interested. But it may have been only a dream, and you know you have laughed at dreams, even told people that if a dog could talk he would likely tell as beautiful dreams as any person. And this may be nothing more than an ordinary dream of an overwrought mind. Well, you get the Bible, and I will tell you the chapter and verse of such and such books, and I will rehearse it to you, just as the angel did to me from Genesis to Revelation. But that would be no proof, Sanford, for you know the Bible off by heart. Still, you may have forgotten it all, for I know you have not looked at that book for many years. If you repeat everything correctly, I shall believe it was a vision. When she told me I had read those verses as though I had the Bible before me, I jumped up, grabbed my hat, and stepped out onto the porch. Are you leaving? inquired my wife. Yes, I am going over to Deacon Ponds and tell him what I have seen and heard, and see what he thinks about it. Don't you think you had better wash up first? Your face looks dirty, and you had better have a bite to eat, for you have tasted no food these three days. You must be faint and hungry. No, I am neither faint nor hungry, but I am dirty, so I will wash up and change my clothes. Then I went to the deacon's sawmill and found him there. I told him I wanted to talk with him for a while if he weren't too busy. We sat down and I told him of the disquietude of my mind for these many years, of the anguish of spirit I had suffered, of my long fast and of my vision. We talked all day until sundown. Neither of us noticed that the mill was not running and that about twenty men had gathered around to listen to our conversation. When all was told, I asked him what he thought about it. He replied, I am deeply impressed. Go home and write it all down lest you forget it, and I want to read it perhaps many times. This took place in the spring of 1816. March 18, if I remember right. When I went into the barn, my father's coffin would come in my mind, and that angel of light would seem to appear. I got so I almost afraid to go in the barn. I could not bear to stay on the place, and I sold out my farm to my brother John. After I sold out to John, I went to the West Ridge five or six miles off and bought a farm and moved on it and lived there that summer. My brother Joseph came in the fall from the state of Vermont, for he said he felt very lonesome since father died, and my wife wanted to see her people. Joseph said if I would move back to Vermont, he would let me have the old homestead father had had. He had land enough without it. We moved up after a few months at the mill. I found that I was too weak to haul the sack of grain. Doctor said I had quick consumption. I rented out the mill. 
My brother John came from York State, he and his wife, to make us a visit, and they wanted me to go back with them. They thought it would be good for my health. After we had got over the high mountain, we soon came into York State. We came to a ditch where the rocks were white with lime. I was very dry and took a good drink of water, and I could perceive that I felt better than I had felt for a long time. By the time I had got to John's, I felt right smart and well. John wanted me to move back again. I said I would if I could sell my mill and buildings in Vermont. He said he would swap with me and let me have my old place back and let Rodney have the mill in Vermont. He, Rodney, was very willing. I went to Vermont and got my family and moved back. John was highly pleased to have me back, but our friendship was of short duration. He and his wife went on a visit down to Old Brimfield, about 300 miles, to see some kin, and he was taken sick and died. They said they would write to us when they got there, but no letter came, and we thought it was strange. One night I went into a trance, and my spirit went down as if going past John's house. Then I saw a wagon covered with a black oilcloth cover and a white horse standing by it. I heard John's girls crying and screaming, Oh, Father, Father, can it be that Father is dead? My spirit went into the home. There was John's wife dressed in mourning, weeping with the girls. She said that John was dead and buried in old Brimfield. As quick as thought, I came out of the trance. Said I, Nancy, John is dead. Have they got a letter from him? No, I have been down there. I thought I would go down there in the morning and tell the girls. I told them I had a vision and that their father was dead and that Susan would be home without him with a wagon covered with black and a white horse. They fairly laughed me to scorn. They said they didn't care about my dreams. They didn't believe but that he would come back as well as he went away. They jumped and danced about the house. I suppose they thought to cheer me, for I was in deep mourning. I was going to the store in a few days, and then I saw the wagon and the white horse that I saw in the vision. I went to the house, and the girls were screaming and saying, Father, Father, can it be that Father is dead? I told her, Susan, all the particulars of my vision, and she said, I declare you have told the truth. You could not have told my story better if you had been on the journey with us. I went home and could not help but think of John and his affairs. I went into the bedroom and lay down, and I cried to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to let me go see my brother John. Immediately I was in a trance, and there came an angel from the spirit world and told me that God had heard my prayers, and he was sent to tell me I might go and see my brother and learn what his will was concerning his widow and the girls. The spirit vanished, and my spirit took its flight to the spirit world. John was in a darkish, dreary-looking place in an old, dilapidated cabin. I told him I had been permitted to come and see him and see what his will was concerning Susan and the girls. Well, said John, you tell the girls it is my will that Susan should have a good, comfortable living. Tell them to let her have the northwest square room to live in, a good bed and bedding, and all that she needs to make her comfortable. She has been a kind mother. Now let them be kind to her. Tell Susan and the girls not to be too much worried about getting gain while on earth, for all things upon the earth are perishable. 
and pass away. Well, Brother John, what is your situation in this spirit world? He said he was in a dark, dismal place, but he must bear it as best he could because justice was done and he could not find any fault. Do you think you will ever be any better off? He did not know anything about it. I took my flight back to my body. I told my wife and Susan I had a vision and what John's will concerning them was. My wife told people she knew it was true as the sun shines. I went and told the girls what I had seen and heard, that Susan was to have it unless she married again. Things went very well for a few weeks, but Nathan flattered up Susan and they went off and got married. Then she had no more right to the house. I told Nathan if I could sell out, I would and go to some other country and get out of sight of John's house. I knew he had worked hard for what he had got, and it troubled me to see some other men would get the benefits of his labors. Nathan said he would trade with me and buy my farm, and he had wild timberland in Ohio. We made a bargain, and I settled up my affairs and prepared to move to the state of Ohio. We started sometime in February. I found the land, what I could see of it, but the most of it was covered with water, and it looked like a bog. I found it was not such land as Nathan had described as being mostly ash and chestnut timber. I worked hard that summer, but thought I could never raise bread on it to support my family. I cried again to God to let me know what was best to be done, and immediately I was in a trance and in a vision. A messenger was sent from the spirit world to tell me what was best for me to do. He informed me that I had better sell the place I was on for it was too hard a place for a man to support a family. He said I had better go to the state of Illinois, not far from Lake Peoria, which was called Fort Clark. He vanished from out of my sight. In selling the land, I had to take it to a high court of justice. There was quite some delay. Nathan Porter came to my place from York State, for fear of his life, for someone had threatened to kill him. He said he had accounts against some men, and they had accounts against him. He wanted to have me go back with him to help settle up his affairs and help him move to the state of Ohio. I told him I would go with him and help him out of that scrape. We got back, and I took his accounts and went and settled up his debts. I had no trouble with anyone at all. Nathan and Susan rode back with me to Ohio in a wagon. It was but a few days before my wife laid in with a little daughter, Nancy Rita Porter, born 8 August 1825. It was a time of sickness with little infants and children. They would be taken with what was called troop or rattles and choke and turn purple, for they were so filled with phlegm they couldn't breathe. There were many that died. The doctors could not save them. Our little baby was taken with it. They wanted me to send for a doctor. I said I would not. I went up to the old widow Johnson's and got her to nurse the child. She gave the child a dose of lobelia. The child was then almost black, but the lobia moved the phlegm so the child could breathe more easy. The fever was very high. I fed it with cold water until the fever abated. Soon the child began to choke again and turn purple. Mrs. Johnson fixed a lobia again until it could breathe. She was the only child that was heard of that had distemper that young and lived. We called her name Nancy, so as to bear up her mother's name. 
I hired a man to help move us to Peoria country. I rented about 10 acres of plain land off of a widow. Chauncey W., my oldest son, was about 12 years old. He could plow the ground, for the man was very handy. He could plow without any driver. He plowed and we planted. We stopped at Farm Creek and Mr. Clark bought a farm there. I did not like it there very well, for I could see that many farms were deserted on account of that creek getting wicked in the spring and piling heaps of wood and deep sand on the farms after the crops had been up several inches. So I went further up onto the edge of the prairie and found a place that pleased me very well, about forty acres covered with beautiful white oak thrifty and good-sized, with a good road running from the Wabash to Port Clark, now called Peoria. I moved my family up there, and once more we went to clearing land and making logs to build a house, a barn, pigsty, and other things, to plow again and to plant, and to reap and get ready for winter. We had plenty of work to do, and then some. I got Morris Phelps to help me, and Chauncey W., my boy, now coming of thirteen, was a smart lad at everything, so we three made good progress, and by winter time we were quite comfortable. Some of the people began stopping at my place for something to eat, etc., and I would charge them nothing. I don't charge certain people anything for what they get here. They are poor, and I will not feel into their pockets for the last dime they have. I will follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you would that they should do unto you under the same circumstances. After we had been here a while, Morris and I thought we would go in partners and build a sawmill each standing half of the expense and sharing half of the profits. There were but two mills in an area of 30 or 40 miles. We saw no reason why we should not pick up a good business. The country was settling up fast, and all the newcomers would all need lumber and such to build their homes. Everything went along fine and until it came time to make the water wheel. When it was all ready, Morris rolled a log about a foot through onto the carriage, hoisted the gate, and let the water in as big as you please. She ran up quick enough, but when she came down and hit the wheel, she stopped. The wheel would not turn fast enough to even start the saw. Well, Morris worked at that thing until he got tired out, red in the face and sweating all over, then quit, cursing the mill and the water and the expense and everything but the real cause, himself. He told me I could have the damn thing if I would take over the debts he was owing. If your debts aren't more than your half, I will take them over for you, provided your creditors are willing to take me as a paymaster. I told him I would never ask any living man for one dollar trust unless we hadn't a crumb in the house to eat. I would buy land and that which I thought I could pay for. If I failed, there was still the land with all the improvements I had made that could be turned back, but no debts for me if there wasn't a sure way out. A man by the name of Camelin owned one of the mills I have spoken of, and when spring came, he went to Peoria and told all the merchants and everyone I was owing, on account of taking over Morris's debts, that they would never get a penny out of me, for as soon as the snow started melting, the water would come down so fast that every inch of my mill would go downstream. I heard of this, went over to Peoria, and told my creditors not to worry about what I owed them until they heard my mill had gone out. Then they could set the law on me. 
Well, I sawed enough lumber between the 1st of April and the middle of June to settle up everything I owed and some to spare. I stepped out of the house one morning to go to the mill and met two strange men. We passed the time of day, and one of them handed me a letter, sealed. I opened it and found it was from Morris Phelps, who then lived on the DuPage about 30 miles from Chicago. My friend tells me you are preachers of a new profession. We will walk into the house, gentlemen. I bade them remove their knapsacks and be seated and ask if they had been to breakfast. They had not. I then told my women folk to prepare a good breakfast for these gentlemen and asked them to excuse me while I went to the mill to see how the boys were coming on with the work and said I would soon be back. My son Chauncey had learned remarkably well and fast how to handle logs, mind the saw, sharpen it, and in fact the order of everything pertaining to the mill. He had outstanding gifts along that line and many others. I told the boys respecting the new preachers and that I must go to them, so they must watch very close that which they did. Morris told me in his letter that these men had been preaching in their neighborhood and had set the Methodist, Baptist, and every other religious profession in an uproar and he wanted me to search them to the bottom and find out, if possible, what their belief was and write him my conclusion. I went back to the house and said, Well, gentlemen, I am ready to hear you expound your doctrine. They told me that they had a prophet, seer, and revelator, that they had apostles, and that their church was organized just as the ancient church of Christ was organized that they had the same gifts, the same power to heal the sick and to cast out devils, the power to ordain every male member to the priesthood, and that these men were given authority to preach their gospel to every nation and kindred tongue and people. If people believed and repented of their sins, the elders of their church were commanded to baptize them by immersion in water and to lay their hands upon their heads and bestow upon them the gift of the Holy Ghost, which would lead them into all truth. As they talked, I surely prayed in my heart that what they were telling me was true. They showed me a new book they had with them and explained where and how it was obtained. I took the book, and together we searched it. For three days and nights, almost without sleep, we searched it. I asked them what their interpretation was to many passages of Scripture. About daylight of the third night, I told them I had asked all the questions I could think of, and they wanted to know what I thought of their doctrine. If you have told me all the truth, gentlemen, and I have not the least doubt of it, your church is the right church and the only one on the face of the whole earth. I knew for a personage from another world had told me that all mankind had transgressed the laws of God, changed the ordinances of the gospel, and broken the everlasting covenant, and I had been commanded to join none of them, for they preached for hire and the adulation of men. Yes, the things of God must be read by the Spirit of God, or all is confusion. They, the promulgators of priestcraft, say that any man claiming to have had a vision is a liar, a blasphemer, a dreamer, and a hypocrite. I had a vision, and I know I had a vision, and they called me all those things, and will not have anything to do with me, nor I with them. They, the elders of this new church, tried hard to persuade me to join their church and be baptized, but I told them it was not good to make haste, but should take your time to repent. I would reflect upon it, and if my belief and faith strengthened after further consideration, I would join. I already believe, for this book you have presented me brings a message I have 
long believed that this continent was inhabited before the Indians came here because many things have been picked up and found that somewhat resemble some of our tools and suggest a civilized people. So I see no reason why this Book of Mormon, as you call it, is not genuine and true. The angel told me there was no society of religion on earth that was right, but that there would be some time soon that I might not live to see it, but my children would. Well, I believe I have lived to see it, but I must know before I join. There is one other thing you have mentioned that I cannot make out how it can be done. That is, the people who join your church must give up all their property into the hand of the leaders that it may be divided so as to make all equal. That is, all property shall become common stock. That would be very well if everyone who joins the church were honest and righteous. But since you are commanded to preach the gospel to all kindred, tongue, and people, I think the gospel net will gather out all sorts of fish, good, bad, and indifferent. You will be taking, therefore, the earnings of, of honest men to support the shiftless, the idle, and lazy loafers of whom even the gods despair. Nancy Warner Porter died May 2, 1864, aged 73, at Porterville, and was buried there May 4. Samford Porter died February 9, 1873, aged 82, at Porterville, Morgan County, Utah, and was buried there February 11. Sanford and Nancy Warner Porter were the proud parents of 13 children, nine sons and four daughters. Chauncey Warner Porter was born October 20, 1812 at Holland, Erie County, New York, and was married December 6, 1833 at Independence, Jackson County, Missouri to Amy Sumner. She bore him eight children. Amy died April 6, 1847, aged 32 at Winter Quarters, now Florence, Douglas County, Nebraska and was buried April 7th at Winter Quarters. Chauncey was married March 6th, 1846 at Winter Quarters to Lydia Ann Cook. She bore him 13 children. Lydia died December 20th, 1882, aged 52, at Orderville, Kane County, Utah, and was buried December 22nd in the Orderville Cemetery. Chauncey was married February 10, 1848, at Winter Quarters to Priscilla Strong. She bore him 11 children. Priscilla died January 9, 1895, aged 64, at Orderville, and was buried January 12th in the Orderville Cemetery. Chauncey died March 3, 1868, aged 55, at Centerville, Davis County, Utah, and was buried March 6th in the Porterville Cemetery. Melinda Porter was born November 3rd, 1814, at Augusta, Oneida County, New York, and was married May 3rd, 1839, at Caldwell County, Missouri, to Ezra Alpheus Chipman. She bore him five children. Ezra died June 3rd, 1913, aged 95, at Bandera, Bandera County, Texas. Melinda died December 17, 1870, aged 56 at Porterville, and is buried there. Sarah Porter was born September 11, 1816, at Plymouth, Oneida County, New York. She was married August 5, 1839, at Montrose, Lee County, Iowa, to David Willard. She was sealed September 6, 1852 to Edward Stevenson in Salt Lake City. Edward died January 27, 1897, age 76. Sarah died June 26, 1841, age 24 at Augusta, Lee County, Iowa. There were no children born to either of her marriages. 
John Present Porter was born July 28, 1818, at Plymouth, Oneida County, New York, and was married February 5, 1843, at Charleston, Lee County, Iowa, to Nancy Rich. She bore him four children. Nancy died December 14, 1857, aged 36, at Centerville, and was buried December 17, in Centerville. John P. was married March 27, 1853, in the endowment house to Mary Palmer Graves. She bore him two children. Mary died June 18, 1896, aged 77, at Porterville, and was buried June 21st in the Porterville Cemetery. John P. died May 28, 1895, aged 76, and was buried May 30th in the Porterville Cemetery. Nathan Tanner Porter was born July 10, 1820, at Corinth, Orange County, Vermont. He was married November 12, 1848, at Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, Utah, to Rebecca Ann Cherry. She bore him two children. Rebecca died December 2, 1922, aged 92, at Salt Lake City, and was buried December 5 in the Centerville City Cemetery. Nathan was married April 13, 1857, in the President's office to Eliza Ford. She bore him 11 children. Eliza died September 17, 1912, aged 71, at Centerville and was buried September 20th in the Centerville City Cemetery. Nathan was married May 24th, 1875, in the endowment house to Elizabeth Alexander. There were no children from this marriage. Elizabeth died February 21st, 1878, aged 71, at Salt Lake City. Nathan died April 9th, 1897, aged 76, at Centerville, and was buried April 11th in the Centerville City Cemetery. Reuben Porter was born in May of 1822 at Augusta, Oneida County, New York, and died there the same month. Sanford Porter, Jr. was born June 25, 1823 at Vienna, Liberty Township, Trumbull County, Ohio. He was married July 25, 1852, in the President's office to Emma Ensign. She bore him ten children. Emma died May 10, 1900, aged 67, at Farmington, Davis County, Utah, and is buried at Porterville. Sanford Porter, Jr. was married July 25, 1852, in the President's office to Melinda Ann Porter. She was the daughter of Sanford's brother, Chauncey, by his first wife, Amy Sumner. She bore him 13 children. Melinda died September 22, 1886, aged 50 at Centerville, and is buried at Porterville. Sanford, Jr. was married September 4, 1889, in the Logan Temple to Virginia Anderson Kilgore. They had no children. Virginia died March 19, 1935, aged 76 at Logan, and was buried March 24 in the Logan City Cemetery. Sanford, Jr. died December 12, 1913, aged 90 at Logan, Cache County, Utah, and was buried December 15 in the Logan City Cemetery. Nancy Arita Porter was born August 8, 1825, at Vienna, Liberty Township, Trumbull County, Ohio, and was married April 7, 1845 at Nauvoo, Hancock County, Illinois, to Edward Stevenson. She bore him five children. Edward died January 27, 1897, aged 76 at Salt Lake City, and was buried January 31st in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Nancy was married July 11, 1870, in the endowment house to Ezra Thompson Clark. They had no children. Ezra died October 17, 1901, aged 77, at Farmington, Davis County, Utah, and was buried October 20th at Farmington. 
Nancy died November 13, 1888, age 63, at Elba, Cassia County, Idaho, and was buried November 21st in the Farmington City Cemetery. Joseph Porter was born June 2nd, 1827, at Vienna, Liberty Township, Trumbull County, Ohio, and died the same day. Hiram Porter, a twin, was born June 2nd, 1827, at Vienna, Liberty Township, Trumbull County, Ohio, and died the same day. Justin Theodore Porter was born May 18, 1829, three miles east of Pekin, Tazewell County, Illinois, and died August 18, 1841, age 12. Lucinda Porter was born in August of 1831, three miles east of Pekin, Tazewell County, Illinois, and died the same month. Lyman White Porter was born May 5, 1833, at Independence, Jackson County, Missouri, and was married November 5, 1852, in the President's Office to Electa Mariah Kilborn. She bore him 11 children. Electa died April 24, 1917, age 81, at Porterville, and was buried April 26 at Porterville. Lyman was married March 18, 1865, in the Endowment House, to Sarah Catherine Emmett. She bore him three children. Sarah died July 6, 1896, age 47, at Porterville, and was buried in the Porterville City Cemetery. Lyman was married October 5, 1867, in the Endowment House, to Elizabeth Bailey. She bore him nine children. Elizabeth died October 27, 1927, age 79, at Porterville, where she is buried. Lyman died March 31, 1914, age 80, at Porterville, and was buried April 3rd in the Porterville City Cemetery. Total known descendants of Sanford Porter and Nancy Warner as of 1993. 13 children, 107 grandchildren, 484 great-grandchildren, 1,679 second great-grandchildren, 4,395 third great-grandchildren, 3,476 fourth great-grandchildren, for a total of 10,155 descendants. There were 3,600 total spouses of children, grandchildren, etc., making 13,755 total descendants, including spouses. As descendants of these fine and faithful people, let us remember their strong, wonderful qualities and try to live our lives to make them proud of us. <laughs>